I'm looking at seven o'clock. <laughs> that probably. <laughs> I turned that off. <laughs> um, Dad, can you turn yourself back on then? Mom, you too. <laughs> Right in the middle of the sentence. <laughs> Unmute. There you How's go. That? Now you're back on. <laughs> they try that all the time up at church. Yeah, but I, I succeeded. So. <laughs> Going to begin with a, a word of prayer and for. Folks at Manbeck, I'm going to include uh, praying for Deb. She had a procedure today, Debbie, and uh, you want details, you can get a hold of Mark. But uh, things apparently went very well. Hoping to get home tomorrow, but let's pray for uh, recovery. Lord, thank you so much for your word, for the reminder over and over again in your word that we are on the winning side. We read the papers and we sometimes wonder about that, but... We need that reminder, that refreshing word from you. Be with us as we study. We pray for Mark and Debbie. We pray, Lord, that uh, she'll heal quickly and uh, get home tomorrow again, continue to meet the needs of that family. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're back to Daniel after a side journey into Revelation and the Antichrist. Just uh, again, kind of review, uh, we've noted several times that Daniel 7 uh, begins what is usually referred to as the second half of the book, uh, with the first part being historical, and then beginning with Daniel 7 on, uh, some of the visions that Daniel had. Actually, there are some who divide the uh, book of Daniel into three parts. Because after we finish chapter 7, beginning with chapter 8, most of those visions relate to the people of Israel. So some look at it and say, we've really got three parts, but uh, we're in Daniel 7. And uh, the first seven verses of that chapter uh, give another vision of four beasts. And uh, we said that they represent the same four that were seen in chapter 2 in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's statue. And uh, probably a couple of reasons why God gave a second vision. Uh, in this vision of the kingdoms, there's a lot of little details that weren't given uh, in the first vision. And secondly, uh, this vision deals much more with the moral aspect of the nations that are coming. The first vision, Nebuchadnezzar's vision, looked at the political ramifications of one kingdom following another. Here we see God saying, not only is one going to follow another, but they're going to progressively get uh, worse and worse morally, uh, morally <laughs> corrupt along the way. Uh, with that moral corruption, uh, we find more brutality as kingdoms overcome other kingdoms. And... Uh, from Daniel's perspective at this point, it doesn't look good for mankind uh, in general. And uh, he sees things going from bad to worse. And the question he has is, where's it all going to go? And uh, in addition to the general moral corruption, uh, he sees also in these visions more and more persecution of God's people. Fortunately, that's not the end of the story. Uh, in verses 9 to 12, uh, Daniel is given a vision of one who was identified there as the Ancient of Days. Uh, we know that that's a reference to God himself. And, and after giving uh, a picture of God in the Ancient of Days, uh, Daniel notes in verse 12 that a little horn is coming. And uh, we've identified that as the Antichrist. And uh, what Daniel learns is that this little horn is going to be judged and thrown into a blazing fire. And the key to understanding all of this is to recognize that the uh, Ancient of Days is going to do judgment on the little horn. And the key to that is the appearance of one in, who in verses 13 and 14 is referred to as the Son of Man. 
Artie's going to read those two verses. Verses 13 and 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like the, a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. I like that uh, reference to the, the Son of Man, you know, here... Uh, Jesus, um, Daniel sees this vision of a, a, a human figure that is called the Son of Man. And God looks at the Son of Man and exalts him uh, above everyone else and allows him to rule beside him on the heavenly throne. Um, and this um, Son of Man is raised to rule and, and is worshipped alongside of God as the divine king of creation. And this uh, dream that Daniel has uh, summarizes kind of the entire biblical story that we have up to this point. Um, Adam and Eve sinned and fell, caused all kinds of problems. And then the son of man comes because God desires that humanity is unified with him to, to rule creation as his wise and image-bearing partners. Um, unfortunately, we know humans turned out to be beasts. <laughs> and uh, so all we can hope for is that a human will come and do for us what we could not do for ourselves. And that human was the person of Jesus. One of the most common ways that Jesus um, is referred to in the New Testament is the title Messiah, or in Greek, the Christ. Um, and that, that means um, the anointed one. And uh, it, it kind of refers, for the Jewish people, uh, it was used to describe the, the Jewish hope of a savior who would come and save the world from death and evil. And uh, all four of the gospel accounts are full of moments where where people are asked, who, who is Jesus? And they, they proclaim him to be the Christ, the Messiah. Um, in fact, if you look at the Gospel of Mark, the very first verse in the Gospel of Mark says, you know, the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. And it kind of makes sense that, that Jesus would be called by that title because that's who, who he was. But what I find interesting is that Jesus almost never, very rarely, almost never uses the title Messiah or Christ to describe himself. Other people use it to describe him, but he doesn't really use it to describe himself. Instead, he uses this title of himself, the Son of Man. Um, and, and it's very interesting to, to, to think about what that title, uh, what did that mean to Jesus, and therefore, what should it mean to us? And, and I think it's, it's important that Jesus considered himself to be the Son of Man because Jesus' humanity matters. Uh, too often, we want to look at Jesus and think of him in, in heavenly terms as the perfect one uh, the, and, and all the things that we, we miracle workers and all that other stuff. And we, we tend to forget that Jesus was uh, human. And we celebrated Christmas just a uh, two, couple of months ago, two months ago, January, January, four months ago. And uh, the uh, there's a there's a Christmas uh, carol that I know my dad doesn't particularly like, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Um, it's <laughs> called "Away in the Manger," <laughs> and uh, there's a passage. There's a, one of the verses in there says, um, "The cattle are lowing, the baby awakes, but little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes." And he was a he was a human baby. Okay, we all know what human babies do. They eat, they sleep, they cry, they poop. 
Those are the only <laughs> things that human babies do. And Jesus did those things, no matter what we want to think about it. Jesus was conceived by the Holy Spirit, but he was, he was birthed by Mary and born as a human. You know, his ability to uh, sympathize with us in our weakness, as Hebrews 4 tells us, and, and, and not sin, as 2 Corinthians tells us, means he was and is the only one who can redeem us because of his humanity and his divinity. And, and a lot of times we, we tend to forget the, the Son of Man when we think about the Messiah, uh, the Christ. In order to be our substitute, Jesus had to be one of us. And, and in order to adequately provide for all of humanity, he had to be God too. And, and reconciling those two uh, concepts together, how he could be man and God at the same time. Um, sometimes we, we want to do away with the, the son of man part of him and just look at him as God. Uh, similarly, uh, God considers him his son and it teaches, that teaches us a lot about himself. Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, Jesus is being baptized, and uh, there's a voice from heaven, and the voice says, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. The uh, firstborn son in, in Jewish thought, in Jewish uh, culture, was very significant. Um, the whole idea of a birthright, if you remember the story of uh, Isaac and Jacob, and the, uh, the, the birthright that um, was, was stolen birthright, I guess. Uh, when, when, when the a parent died, when the father died, if the father had two sons, they, the, the inheritance was divided three ways. And three, three, three ways. And the oldest son got a point, and the middle son, the, the second son got, got, got a, a portion, and then the oldest son got a third another portion an extra portion that birthright because sons were were had a had a purpose for being around um, they were supposed to the oldest son was supposed to take over the family sons were viewed in that time as as chosen prepared with a purpose uh, intended to carry on the vision of the father and and jesus does that uh, in fact i think that kind of shapes the 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 significance of Jesus being called the Son of Man. Jesus' job was to complete what uh, the purpose that God the Father had uh, that had been set down and since Adam and Eve sinned and, and fell in the Garden of Eden. Uh, that purpose was redemption of humanity uh, from the penalty of sin. And from that sinful nation and nature, he inherited because of that. We inherited because of, of Adam's sin. Verse 13 in uh, Daniel uh, talks about the Son of Man coming in the clouds from heaven. And uh, we understand that the Son of Man was human enough to, to dwell on earth with us. It, that, that part is true, that he is also God. And he would come from heaven itself and be, therefore, far more significant than the little horn that came up out of the sea, the turbulent sea. In the Old Testament, an appearance from the clouds is uh, usually talks about God showing up. Uh, in Exodus chapter 19, we have an appearance of God to Moses. And in verse 9, uh, Exodus 19.9, it says, The Lord said to Moses, I'm going to come in you in a dense cloud. Um, so the idea of coming coming down from heaven and is, is a a symbol of this is this is coming from God. In verse 14, we're told that God, identified there as the Ancient of Days, will give to the Son of Man authority and power to rule over the earth. Artie, if you could read verse 14 again. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. If you read this quickly in the context of what Daniel has been writing, uh, we see a similarity between 
the authority that's going to be given to the Son of Man and that which earlier uh, Daniel had spoken of God giving to Nebuchadnezzar uh, and then to, to Darius. Uh, like them, the, the Son of Man is going to be given authority over nations and peoples. But Daniel's vision didn't stop with the simple announcement that the Son of Man would be given authority over nations, but he added a tremendously important note. He said his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, when Daniel heard this, saw this uh, in a vision, I think he undoubtedly thought in terms of the Messiah, and the Messiah that they were looking for was a promised one who would come and he was going to set up a permanent kingdom, uh, the kingdom that was given to David and then promised to his descendants. For example, in uh, 2 Samuel 7, 16, we read, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. First Chronicles 7, 14, it is another note on that same promise to David and reads, I will set him over my house and my kingdom forever. His throne will be established forever. I, I'm sure when Daniel thought of that, he thought in terms of the Messiah, uh, could not have possibly pictured all that was going to take place, but that was his starting point. In verses 15 and 16, uh, we read that Daniel asked for more information on the vision and uh, asked it of one that we assume uh, was an angel that was there. Uh, the one to whom the question of explanation is directed is not fully identified, but we know that from verse 10 that uh, the Ancient of Days was surrounded by uh, thousands of angels to do his bidding. And we know elsewhere in scripture that angels were often the ones that God used to communicate uh, visions and their meaning to people. So we assume that this was an angel that was there and Daniel says to him, hey, what's going on? I think it's interesting when we read this that, that Daniel uh, has seen some absolutely incredible visions of the future. And yet that verse tells us that he was troubled in spirit. Uh, sometimes we are told as Christians that we ought not to worry about anything, shouldn't be troubled about anything. Uh, I think perhaps in theory that sounds good, but the reality of it is that there are a lot of things we don't understand, a lot of questions we have. And like Daniel, I think we sometimes feel overcome uh, with the cares and the pressures of life and so on. They ask the question, and again, one of the truths that I think we miss too often in uh, studying God's word is that God is actually anxious uh, to answer our questions. Any questions he's asked, if they're legitimate questions, have legitimate answers, he is more than willing to share with us. Now, God's not in the business of answering the curiosity kinds of things we have. And there are times when he says, you know what? I didn't even tell my son that, so I'm not going to tell you all of that. But when we have honest questions, God's going to seek to give us honest answers. Sometimes they're going to be found in the Word of God when we read it and study it. Sometimes his Holy Spirit kind of speaks to us through our spirit. Uh, sometimes it's uh, just some friend or someone that comes along. But God does, is not in the business of hiding his will his desire for us. And uh, we too often say, well, I don't understand it. God says, take time. I'll let you know what it means. And so Daniel takes the time and asks the question of the angels that are around him. Uh, so I'm having this vision, these visions, and I kind of want to know what they mean. And so in verses 17 and 18 of uh, Daniel chapter 7, uh, the angel begins to explain things to Daniel, and the this the explanations are very basic, um, and kind of basically says what we've been saying all along that these four beasts 
represent four kingdoms already referred to in Nebuchadnezzar's um, statue from from Daniel chapter 2, I believe it was. Uh, Verse 18 uh, refers to the people of God, uh, which for Daniel was was the Jewish people, of course. Today, we understand that that it it includes uh, us as Christians. Uh, the latter part of verse 18 is, in, is really important, I think, because it emphasizes the fact that God, ultimately, God is going to establish a kingdom for his people over which he will rule. Uh, verse 18, Mom, if you could read that one. But the holy people of the Most High will receive the kingdom and will possess it forever. Yes, forever and ever. Every, every once in a while, that phrase, uh, saints of the most high, is talking about angels. But I think uh, this is fairly clear in this passage and in other passages that it's talking about, about people here. The, the holy people are, uh, are also, and saints are also mentioned four or five different times in this uh, passage um, here in uh, Daniel chapter 7 as we scan down through it. Uh, that phrase, most high... Uh, of course, refers to God, and I, I think it's interesting. It the Most High is actually a plural <laughs> in, in the a plural noun in the the, the translation. Um, not some have suggested it, it's it might be because you know the Trinity or something like that. Uh, it's probably um, just kind of expressing how much the majesty of God is. Um, even though most high is plural, the other personal pronouns uh, talk about his and him. Uh, they're, they're all singular. And so I think it's, it's an order of magnitude. If we're talking about how, how bad the little horn is, and we now turn around and talk about how awesome the most, most high is. I mean, not just, not just kind of high, but most high. Um, and, and that phrase, the most high, is, is repeated again a number of times throughout uh, this chapter. Um, and, and, and when we look at it, we can associate the most high with the ancient of days. Um, it is, it, it's the same person, a uh, person of God. The uh, idea, okay, I, I read this in a, in a commentary and I was quite confused. It said, the fact that this kingdom will last forever and ever indicates that there will be no end to it yeah that's a pretty strong indication forever and ever (laughs) i'm pretty sure if it's forever and ever there won't be an end to it it's very wise statement um but i think it ties in really well with the book of revelation we looked at that uh last week but the millennial kingdom in the book of revelation uh talks about a new heaven and a new earth over which the son of man will rule forever um and then Daniel turns uh, and uh, has some questions, uh, particularly to the angel, about this fourth kingdom. If you remember the first three kingdoms in Daniel's vision, the first one, uh, it looked like a lion with uh, wings on it. The second one was a bear, and I think it had ribs in its teeth. The third one was a, a leopard uh, with uh, multiple heads. And then he goes, this fourth beast is crazy, uh, with ten horns, and he doesn't even describe it as an animal. Um, And Daniel really needs to understand and wants to understand, what is this fourth kingdom? Uh, Mon, could you read verse 19? That's the, the description Daniel gives of this fourth kingdom again. Uh, <clears throat> Daniel called it a different from all the others and most terrifying, with its iron teeth and bronze claws, the beast that crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It's uh, basically all it's doing is repeating the the description of this beast from, from verses seven and eight earlier, but it includes a little bit of an addition about bronze claws, which, you know, if you saw a beast with bronze claws, I think you'd be a little curious about it too, just like Daniel. And I think it's interesting that Daniel uh, doesn't simply just say claws, but he, it actually says bronze claws. Um, bronze is used in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, 
uh, to depict hardness and strength. Um, and it's used in, in judges to describe uh, the shackles that were used to bind uh, Samson uh, after he was captured. Um, Jeremiah chapter uh, 52 talks about bronze shackles used to take King Zedekiah into captivity in Babylon. Anything that was strong uh, was, was considered to be bronze. And so Daniel sees these bronze claws uh, on this beast and, and, uh, and just kind of emphasizes the, the strength of this, of this fourth beast. In ancient times, the best weapons of war were made of bronze. Um, and, so, and so that's kind of where that came from. Uh, verse 20 then continues Daniel's inquiry into the vision, uh, focusing on the horns of the fourth beast, and in particular that little horn that we talked about. Um, and he, verse 20 is, is basically a repeat of verse uh, eight that he kind of says hey, what was going on here. Daniel notes in there that the horn looked more imposing than the other ones. Uh, more imposing look seems to stem from a, an intimidating eye that it had uh, and the way it spoke. Um, we don't often picture horns with eyes and speaking, but that's that's kind of the, the, the vision that Daniel has. And I find it interesting that Daniel very specifically talks about this, this horn as speaking boastfully um, rather, than, rather than speaking you know, glory to God or anything like that. It's a very boastful horn. When I've been reading this through, there's an ad on television for some anti-allergy medication. And uh, as you're watching the TV uh, in the real world, that's in America, I don't know about up there, and <laughs> this big thing that looks like a tree, an ugly head comes up and uh, it's supposed to represent allergies. And uh, the guy that's taking the right one says, I'm not afraid of them. And I thought, you know, this is their attempt to picture something that really is difficult to picture uh, as, a, as a beast. And uh, that's what Daniel is doing here. Uh, in verse 21, uh, he adds some more interest regarding the little horn. Uh, Artie, you want to read that? As I watched, this horn was waging war against the holy people and defeating them. A rather interesting detail uh, that had not been given previously in it. And obviously, this is going to be a great concern uh, to Daniel, because this involves the people of God. Now, earlier, uh, we read that God gave the Israelites into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar as part of his judgment on the sins of the nation. And uh, then history records other times when the people of God were uh, brought into slavery, were attacked, were hurt in one way or another because they had disobeyed God and God was in the process of judging them for it. <laughs> Here, however, we get a very different picture. Uh, we get the picture that this uh, little horn is, is acting on his own. Uh, he's more severe and uh, he's doing it on his own, not something that God had asked him to do. Now, of course, we know ultimately God allowed it. Uh, but it wasn't punishment per se because the people of God had failed him. It's simply the evil one uh, seeking to inflict injury on the people of God. That phrase, uh, holy people, for Daniel, probably looked specifically at the Jewish people. That's who they were as far as he was concerned. Uh, of course, today uh, we know that it includes God's people. Uh, some commentators see this as a specific reference to uh, Jewish uh, people during the tribulation, the Jewish Christian. I, I think it's much more broad than that. Given the message of persecution that will fall on God's people, uh, Daniel at this point had to have been more than discouraged. So the angel explaining the vision uh, to him immediately added, according to verse 22, that the persecution would take place 
until the Ancient of Days came and pronounced judgment in favor of the holy people of the Most High, and the time came when they possessed the kingdom. And this verse largely repeats information found in verses 9 to 14, but it adds new meaning to it because it's related specifically to the persecution that's going to come on God's people. Uh, and it's a reminder that we've seen throughout the book. We are on the winning side. God is in control. Daniel is told two things, I think, in, in this. God's told that God is, that or Daniel is told that God is going to pronounce judgment on the Antichrist. Uh, I think sometimes we see things going on and we say, how are they getting away with that? Why doesn't God do something about it? Well, ultimately, he is going to judge sin. He's going to judge evil. But not only is this picturing the judgment of evil, but it's also a picture of God vindicating his people. He pronounces his people innocent. And again, uh, that may be a while coming and we sometimes wonder about it, but uh, that's the reality of it. In verses 23 to 27, uh, the angel basically just reaffirms what uh, Dave, Daniel has already said. And verse 23 uh, notes that the havoc wrought by the fourth beast will be more destructive and worldwide than initially noted. It's a picture of extreme brutality and involves some form of worldwide domination. Now that's important to remember because this passage deals with the Antichrist at the end of the days, the ones we looked at last week from Revelation. Next chapter, we're gonna see a smaller Antichrist uh, who's going to wreak havoc on God's people, called an Antichrist, but uh, limited at that particular time. When we then get to uh, verse 24, we get a little bit more detail on the 10 kingdoms. Verse 24, mom. The 10 horns are 10 kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. I got to tell you, there has been a lot of speculation over the years as to the identity of these 10 kingdoms. Uh, some commentators have tried to identify them with 10 different Greek kingdoms that uh, kind of followed Alexander the Great. Um, some have taken a look and seen it as the Roman Empire and trying to figure out which kingdoms came out of the Roman Empire. Um, uh, that, I, I kind of like that personally. I, I, I like the Roman Empire idea. Uh, some see the Ten Kingdoms here as, as um, if we're making a parallel with Nebuchadnezzar's uh, uh, dream, uh, statue dream in Daniel chapter 2. Um, it's got ten toes, and now we have ten kingdoms, I guess. Um, what we can't tell for sure is if ten, the number ten, literally means 10 kingdoms if it's if it's an exact number or if it's a figurative picture um we know that uh, there are certain numbers that are used in scripture uh, over and over again that don't necessarily mean exactly that number we the number seven occurs so many times the number 40 occurs so many times. The number 10 is, is one of those numbers. Um, it, it's used elsewhere in scripture to talk about a, a completeness, a wholeness. So 10 is when it's all done. There were, there were 10 of them. Um, it just means it's complete. The, the, the nice thing is, uh, in the end, the, an exact number or specific identification of these kingdoms doesn't really matter. What matters is that there seems to be a, a coalition of kingdoms or nations, and, and this little horn, the Antichrist, will rule over some and control the rest until God judges him. 
The fact that the uh, Son of Man puts an end to this kingdom indicates that there are end time kingdoms that may or may not be related to a revival in some form of the nations that correspond to the old Roman Empire. Revelation 17, 12 and 13 says, the 10 horns you saw are 10 kings who have not yet received the kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with uh, the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to that beast. I think mom was supposed to read that, but I read it anyways. Oops, <laughs> <They're sorry>. fine. <laughs> Remember that one, Ma. Um, what I find interesting in that in that um, verse, though, is, is that it talks about one hour. They're given control over one hour. Well, 10 means complete. Uh, 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 what is the opposite of 10? Well, the opposite of 10 is one. It's just, just a little bit of time uh, rather than complete, a short amount of time. And so these these 10 kingdoms might be complete but they're they're not going to they're not going to last the fact that another king will arise <laughs> implies that the alliance that created these 10 kings will will come from this kingdom will be in place when the when the antichrist comes to power evidently these uh, three kings somehow will refuse to allow the antichrist to control them and therefore he comes in and conquers them and takes control and then the other seven kingdoms kind of fall into line and will continue to function as separate kingdoms or countries, but in some way will be controlled by the Antichrist. One of the fun things in trying to identify the 10 kingdoms has been movements over my lifetime uh, to pick out certain things. Early on, we we're in Bible school, uh, commentators, as many of them were absolutely convinced that those 10 kingdoms uh, was the Soviet Union. And they counted all the little parts of it and said, ah, we've come up with 10. And uh, when that kind of fell apart, uh, the next movement had been to identify the European Union and uh, count all the countries that are in there. And, and then we get all messed up because England pulls out and, you know, we're not sure where to go. I think Dan was right in saying, you know, the, the bottom line is that God's saying it's going to happen. It's going to happen that way. Verse 25 uh, repeats an awful lot of what uh, has already been said, but it uh, gives us some real insight into uh, the Antichrist. Artie, I'll let you read it. <laughs> <laughs> he will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and half a time. Okay. <laughs> While you're reading it, you want to explain? No. Afraid <laughs> <laughs> not. This, this, this passage tells us several things about uh, the Antichrist and the kinds of things he will do. Uh, it talks about him speaking against uh, the Most High God. Uh, that expression carries with it the idea that he's going to blaspheme God. You know, we live in a day and age when blaspheming God is in vogue. Uh, people continually thumb their nose at him and at God's word and uh, so forth. So we really set a stage uh, for the Antichrist at any point to fit right in. And uh, when he comes, uh, if he comes soon, and some of us think he will, uh, boy, he's got a stage all set to encourage him in those blasphemous ways. Secondly, he's going to oppress, oppress his holy people. Uh, that word oppress is a rather interesting one. In the Aramaic, uh, it word implied wearing out. And it was kind of a picture used to describe old clothing that had worn out and was therefore no good. I, I like the imagery of it. It seems as if uh, Daniel is saying the Antichrist is going to harass believers uh, to the point where they're going to be asking themselves, how much more can I take? Uh, and I think that is so true as we see more and more what the Antichrist is going to do. Uh, Matthew 24, 21 uh, has an answer to that 
as Jesus refers to that period. Uh, Artie, I think you've got that one. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the word world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. How much longer? God says, wait a minute, I know exactly how much I'm going to allow him to do, and uh, that's going to be the end of it. The third thing says he will try to change the set times and the laws. As we read in Revelation, uh, there's a period of time in which the Antichrist is going to pretend to be on the side of Israel, and then he's going to break his covenant with uh, Israel. He's going to set himself up to be worshipped. And uh, part of what he's going to do at those times is to set aside the practices of God's people. I find it rather interesting that uh, Seventh-day Adventists have taught over the years that uh, the Antichrist was really, is really Catholicism. And uh, they blame the early popes who changed the sabbath from the sabbath saturday uh, to sunday and say ah that's how it all fits in i don't think so uh, they also have a few other interesting beliefs regarding uh, the end times uh, daniel 9 says uh, i'm going to give you a little more detail on that so we'll get to that in two weeks <laughs> or three <laughs> however it goes uh, on that and then finally uh daniel says here the holy people will be delivered into his hand for a time, times and a half time. Uh, we've looked at that earlier, probably three and a half years, whatever time it is, mm -hmm. uh, what the important thing is, God has said, I am going to limit the activities of the Antichrist. I'm going to allow him to do many harmful things, but I've still got my hand on him and it's limited. Uh, Daniel talks here about the Antichrist trying to change the set times and the laws. Um, Daniel's not told, Daniel does not tell us here if this succeeds or not. Uh, but there apparently will be the effort during the uh, reign of the Antichrist, the influence of the Antichrist, to limit religious freedom. And Daniel 8 and a couple of passages there provide additional act information on the activities, especially in relationship to uh, worship practices. I wonder as a, as a pastor, if we're not again seeing the groundwork for this being laid as governments pass legislation uh, that makes it in their minds a crime to discriminate against practices that God's word calls sin. And I'm wondering if the day isn't going to come sooner than we would like it to come when the government's going to order us as pastors uh, to perform services that we simply refuse to do because we don't believe uh, God's word allows us to. Some interesting times coming for the church, and uh, I'm glad I'm on this end of it uh, <laughs> rather than beginning at this point. But uh, God's people will stand firm, and that we can be sure of. One might wonder, though, why the Antichrist uh, at this point, uh, the little horn, is going to be so determined to attack God's people uh, on it. I think there are several reasons why uh, in the end times this little horn, the Antichrist, is going to be so opposed to, to God's people. Uh, first of all, he's going to be totally controlled by Satan. And Satan hates God, and therefore he hates God's people. And so it's natural that he would want to oppose us. And uh, the biblical standards uh, of the church are in total opposition to the sinful ways of Satan and the ways he wants to promote. Uh, he wants us to fall in line with that. And when Christians stand up and say, that is wrong, we want to hold to a godly standard. 
Uh, Satan is not going to be happy. The Antichrist is not going to be uh, happy. And uh, hopefully the, the church is going to uh, take a stand and oppose those things. And anyone who opposes the Antichrist uh, is going to be asking for his wrath. Uh, but that's our responsibility as believers. And um, pretty much the whole purpose of the book of Daniel um, and the whole Bible is to, to tell us in the end that God is still in control, even though the, the Antichrist and Satan will seem to have power for a time, God is still in control. Uh, look at verse uh, 26, if you will. But the court will sit, and his power will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. When, when Jesus returns, uh, that evil empire of the world, uh, so the, the little horn and the Antichrist, will be judged and, and destroyed. And, and then we get to verse 27, which is such a, a wonderful, glorious picture for us as believers. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be handed over to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all rulers will worship and obey him. You know, Jesus uh, promised uh, in the Sermon on the Mount that uh, the, the believers will inherit the earth, and the kingdom that will be set up uh, at this point is is both universal and everlasting uh, if you remember in verse 13 and 14 of this chapter we're told about the son of man who is given authority glory sovereign power all nations and people every language will worship him his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and this kingdom is one that will never be destroyed and think about that. Think about the truth of what will one day be given to God's people and compare that to the way the world has viewed his people throughout history. God's people have been despised, persecuted, made fun of, rejected. But in the end, God will honor us. That's what it counts, I think. Yeah, it counts <laughs> at the end. Up to then, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and we get to the last verse in, in the, the Daniel chapter 7, and it basically relates Daniel's response to all of this. Uh, Daniel was in shock, deeply troubled, it says. Um, his face turned pale, um, and, and, but he kept the matter to himself. Daniel had seen so much that he could not have hoped to understand, and Yet he, he wrote it down for us so that you know, we cannot understand it, I guess. <laughs> um, seeing images of kingdoms rise and fall and persecution of God's people and just has to trouble him. And, and it should trouble us as well when we see um, Christians being persecuted. Uh, the phrase, I kept the matter to myself, and it doesn't, uh, isn't uh, totally clear, but probably an idiom, uh, a statement to kind of say, uh, kind of what Mary said. I treasured these things in my heart when, when she found out she was going to be uh, Jesus' uh, mother. Uh, I, I, I kept them in my heart. I continued to ponder them. I, I kept the matter to myself. I, I molded over in my brain. Um, if Daniel had seen more than he could have hoped to understand, it, it wasn't over for him. And when we next week, when we get to chapter 8, uh, we'll get another vision that will also kind of tie in with the, this ver vision and Nebuchadnezzar's vision. Uh, we'll talk about a ram, a goat, and a little horn. Uh, it is 7.50, and so I want to take some time to open up and ask if there are any questions that any of you might have. I know there's a lot of stuff going on in today's lesson. Uh, but if you have any questions, please do me a favor and unmute yourselves. Um, and uh, we are more than willing to let mom answer any questions you, you might have. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 
because we get three extra minutes today that we didn't lose last week. And if we get another <laughs> 10 minutes today, we're going to have so much time for next week. It's going to be great. <laughs> Which we may need. <laughs> we might. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who like history, and I'm one who does, but don't have the knowledge that Dan does, a lot of history in next week's lesson. Yeah. <laughs> I started working on the PowerPoint today, so it'll be good. <laughs> <laughs> no questions? That's always means that either we've explained it so well <laughs> <laughs> or we've confused you so much, one or the other. Dad, why don't you close us in a word of prayer, and then we can all go watch the Phillies game. Okay. <laughs> Do I pray for the Phillies? <laughs> they need it. <laughs> Unless you're a Mets fan, then, there, then we've created a problem. Lord, again, thank you for the reminder over and over again that you are the sovereign one that we are on the winning side, that you are in total control of history. And when it seems to be spinning out of control, it's really still under your control. You allow things to happen. In some cases, you cause things to happen as part of your way of bringing us closer to yourself. But Lord, we're just so glad to know that one day we're gonna reign with our savior. What a glorious time that is going to be. Continue with each one of us now in the days that are ahead. As we look forward to Sunday, bless your word as it's shared in each church. In Jesus' name, amen.